Service is always wonderful to have everybody here. As you know, we're going to be doing our charge conference that will be following service. And following that, we will have a luncheon there in the fellowship hall. So everyone, please uh, welcome to attend and hope you all can stay. And our regular announcements this morning, of course, chair aerobics continues Monday, Wednesday, Friday here at Bethany in the fellowship hall. Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. Bible study and uh, 7 p.m. at Oakland Bible study. And I guess this will be the last of their series on the Holy Spirit. Next week, we will take off for Thanksgiving. And when we resume in December, we will begin studying Luke. So you might want to start reading over that and be prepared. It should be very interesting. Uh, of course, community uh, prayer service uh, Wednesdays from 7 to 7.30 at Oakland. And this Thursday, we will, of course, be uh, volunteering for Gleaning for the World. That will be from 1.30 to 3.30. And if you would like to carpool, we meet here at 12.45. You can get a ride down. Um, are there any other announcements this morning? Okay, well, thank you. Well, thank you. We're glad to have you with us. Hope we can do this more often, have get-togethers like this. Anything else? Okay, thank you. this morning is a prayer for the church found there on the screen and in the bulletins. Please stand and let's join together. <clears throat> Let us pray. Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit of promise and Spirit, Spirit of unity, unity, we thank you that you are also the Spirit of revival and renewal. Renew in our church that passionate desire for the coming of your kingdom which will unite all Christians in one mission to the world. May we all experience revival and grow up together into him who is our head, the Lord and Savior of the world, in whose name we pray. Amen. If you will, please turn to page 395 and let's join together and take time to be holy.
Well, good morning. good morning. Wow, maybe we should have charge conference every Sunday. It is nice to look at and see a full congregation this morning. So we have many joys and concerns to share today. And if y'all don't mind, I'm going to go first. That way I don't forget to say what I need to say. I have a tendency to do that sometimes. So I uh, guess most of y'all have heard by now that Leanne's grandmother passed away yesterday afternoon. And so she's claimed the promise of the resurrection. And um, the family's gathering today to, you know, make the funeral arrangements. Uh, I will give you all a heads up. It's a good possibility it'll be Tuesday morning uh, because Leanne has a niece that's a uh, freshman down at Mars Hill and they want her to be able to get back before dark on Tuesday. So we may have to move Bible study back a week in order to get that last weekend. I'll let you all know once the decision is made and we'll get an announcement going around to folks. But just to give you a heads up, uh, I know that's something that they've talked about. So. And Leanne wanted me to thank you all for all your prayers and concerns. Uh, it's meant a lot, and so uh, we do appreciate that. Also, I want to let you know that um, I'm delighted we'll be volunteering again this Thursday at Gleaning for the World, uh, but I won't be there with you. Uh, I have an appointment for a spinal block Thursday morning at the surgery center, and I want you all to pray that that works, because if it does, then you all know... Uh, a few weeks after that, I'll be getting an oblation on the nerves so that it be, be nice if I can start the new year off pain-free. That, that would be awesome. So uh, appreciate your prayers for that. Uh, also, we'll let you know that uh, Raleigh Milstead, his surgery was successful with the cancer. They think they've got it all, um, and they appreciate your prayers. So what other joys or concerns do we need to share this morning? Got it. And I'll tell you what, PT does help a whole lot. Won't, won't cure it, but it, it helps a lot. Oh, well, no. <laughs> Tommy, are you doing all right with your back? Yeah, I'm playing a little soccer now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably very little soccer, right? <laughs> yeah. Be in prayer for Laura. I heard there was a rather exciting game at JF Friday night. Yeah. I think Orange County needs your prayers. Mm -hmm. Any others? Well, Yet. Absolutely. We're excited for her. June? Um, I have a joy and a concern. The joy, Ella's surgery went really well. Good. I right boy, I took her back to the doctor. The doctor said the eye looks good. Good. Uh, she's not having the pain in this one like she did in the right eye. Oh, thank God. My concern is, I don't know how many of you have heard, but Valor Farms lost yes. their barn and office to a fire. I talked to Okay, office supplies. Very good. So we've been prayer for the folks down at Valor Farms, and we'll see what we can do to help them. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, and also, I want to let you know that our prayers for um, Mark Wilkerson's family were was for his wife, Brenda, who she didn't have cancer at the time. Uh, she had a seizure. And so they're having to treat her for the seizure at UVA. So continue to keep Brenda Wilkerson in your prayers. So it wasn't cancer? No, it wasn't cancer. It, it was a seizure. So are there any other joys and concerns? Well, sit back for just a moment. Yeah, we've been praying for this young fella. And I hope you got the volume up there. Levi Keller, a five-year-old boy from Virginia, whose life has been anything but normal since he was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. He was two and a half when uh, we noticed his uh, left eye was starting to protrude out a little bit. Quickly thereafter, within the next few days, we had biopsies done and uh, I think we spent, what, two weeks at the hospital the first time and then came home for a couple of weeks while they were trying to uh, put together a plan to, uh, to go about treating it. Levi was diagnosed with a rare type of tumor that affects children and adolescents. And unfortunately, they weren't able to do surgery to remove it. His tumor is inoperable because of where it's at. And the ideal situation would have been surgery and chemo and radiation altogether, but he was only able to do chemo and radiation. Um, and we have currently been to, we've consulted four or five different hospitals across the country, um, just trying to find anything, any trials, any um, other procedures that may be, you know, something that could give him a chance, offer some hope. The concern is that because we're only doing chemotherapy, that eventually uh, he would become either too toxic to continue. or resistant to the chemo. So here we are again on our knees praying. But I will tell you, to be five years old, that little boy has faith. Um, that inspires me. The other day, I started counting. Um, I think he told me 10 times that he loved Jesus. Um, I was like, I'm going to count this today. Um, but watching his relationship with the Lord grow, and he is, um, there will be times when things are hard and he'll say, Mama, we need to pray right now. And then sometimes he'll ask, do you think anyone's praying for me right now? And I assure him that of course somebody is praying for him right now. Currently he goes for chemo a week at a time. Um, and those weeks are tough. Like, on him, he can be nauseous and um, that wears him down a little bit, but he quickly bounces back. Cancer hasn't stopped Levi from enjoying his favorite sport or from joining a new team, the Liberty Flames. Oh, God. <laughs> Levi has brought something unique to our team perspective as well as, you know, um, just not every day that you get to have a five-year-old in the locker room. Great are you, Lord. Team Impact is an organization that matches children facing serious illness and disability with college sports teams to create a long-term life-changing experience for everyone involved. And when they contacted Liberty about Levi, the Flames welcomed him with open arms. Levi, the five-year-old energy ball. It's the best way to describe him. Um, five-year-old kid who is just full of adventure, energy, enthusiasm. He has a unique form of cancer behind his eye, which has just greatly weighed him down and his family down. 
Um, but it doesn't stop him from being all that God created him to be, which is just the most adventurous, joyful, young little boy I honestly have ever met in my whole entire life. When Levi's around the group, there is a, this overwhelming sense of joy uh, that I think he brings. Uh, I think our guys do a really good job of making him smile, but I think his, his smile and his attitude is contagious. It's been a blessing. They've made him a part of the team. Yeah. And he feels yeah. like he's a part of the team. And he tells people that. He tell, and they gave him um, a shirt it says like, Liberty University Soccer, and they gave him some blue socks with a cross on it. And he wore those into um, the oncology clinic the other day. And he was like, I've got my cross socks on, just like my soccer team. I'm on the soccer team, and people are going to know I love Jesus, mm -hmm. you know? So um, he was showing everybody his blue socks. The team has helped him through some of his tough times, too, like being in oncology. And they have been able to uh, video chat with him during that time. And, really lighten the mood and make things a lot yeah. easier. Levi, what up, dude? I was just sitting here thinking... And in many ways, Levi has inspired the flames just as much as they've hoped to inspire him. My experience with him has opened my eyes to seeing God's hand in the struggle, seeing how he is strong in our weaknesses, being able to just spend time with him and see how he is still just covered in so much joy despite what's impairing him. It has impacted me way more than I have impacted him. Levi has just come in being a pure young boy that he is. And that purity has really opened the eyes of this whole entire team to think, wow, like it is so much bigger than us. It is so much bigger than this sport. The, this life is so much bigger than what happens on the field that when Levi comes in, it's really just showed us there's something more than just the sport. To see that we have influenced Levi shows that this school, the coaching staff, and all the players know what we are here to do, and that is to shed the love of Christ wherever. And soccer is just a means to do that. And so to know that we've impacted Levi is to think, wow, like we are doing what God has called us to do. We are maximizing the gifts he has given us and returning them to him in whatever fold that looks like. This has helped us to uh, certainly grow closer to God. And uh, you know, no matter the outcome, we know that God's got his arms wrapped around that little boy. God loves him. and. He loves God and he's going to be okay. We have that hope. You know. We keep praying for an earthside miracle. We do. And um, we're not giving up hope or prayer. I think one of the things that this season has reminded us is our children are not ours. They're God's, and He, he blessed us with them to steward them. Um, so you have to hold them with open hands back to the Lord. And we pray often that we get to see His children's children. That would be such a blessing. But His will be done. We will continue to keep Levi and his family in our prayers. Th thank you, Trish, for letting us know about that. What an inspiration that was for everyone. Yes. And think about those college kids. What, you know, that age group. Just think what an inspiration he's been for them. And keep in mind what the, like the assistant coach said. Their, their mission is to spread the love of Christ. Soccer is their means of doing it. That's the same mission we have, is to spread the love of Christ around the world, beginning in our neighborhood. As the old gospel song says, brighten the corner where you are. So let us bow our heads and lift up our hearts now as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings you bestow upon us. Sometimes 
the, the blessings are joyful occasions. Sometimes the blessings are presented in the form of challenges. But Father, whatever the situation, we know that you were in the midst of all of them. That you were there in our rejoicing and you are there in our sorrow. Because you're there 24-7. And we thank you that you are. Because Father, as the old gospel hymn says about prayer, we need thee every hour. And we know you are always there for us. Father, help us likewise to be there for you. Because we know that the blessings you bestow upon us are not just for our benefit alone, but they're there for us to share with the world. That together, we all can be like Christ to the world. And we know, Father, that it is through your Son and your Holy Spirit that you are present with your creation today. So help us to be mindful of our calling, that we've not been called for individual greatness or any special privilege, but we have been called for a special purpose, and that is to shed the love of Christ wherever we may be, to let people know of your love and your only means of salvation, that no matter how big our problems may be, you're much, much bigger. And you're always there when we are calling. So, Father, we thank you that you not only hear us when we pray, but you answer our prayers. And sometimes you surprise us by allowing us to be the answer to someone else's prayer. Hear us now, Father, as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Kids, come on down. All right, good to see you all here today. Do you all know who Nick Saban is? Nick Saban is considered the the greatest football coach of all time. That's why you see the GOAT in those Aflac commercials. The GOAT greatest of all time. <laughs> Nick Saban said that talent without discipline is nothing. Think about that. Talent without discipline is nothing. You see, you can have the natural talents to be a great athlete. But if you don't have the discipline to prepare yourself, he says, it's worth nothing. You can be a talented player, but if you don't go through the practice and conditioning that's necessary, oh, you may play great for just a little bit, but you won't be able to play great for the whole game. You may have the talent, but if you don't know the plays, then you can't really execute as you need to. So yes, talent is great, but talent without discipline is nothing. 
And that's going to be the lesson we learn from our gospel text this morning. When Jesus gives the parable of the talents. Where two of the Lord's servants, they were disciplined when they received the talents and invested it and made good return, doubled. But the third one was lazy and took the talent that he had received and just buried it in the ground. And we're responsible for the talents that God gives us. And God gives each of us talents. Not for our own use, but to benefit others. That in the church, each of us has been given a different talent so that together we can succeed in our mission. Just like a team can succeed if they take the talent and discipline and work hard enough, they can succeed. And we have an important mission. Do you know what the mission of the church is? It's to share Jesus' love with others. And you all, as part of the church, share in that mission. As a team, you go through the drills and you learn the fundamentals of your sport. Every sport has fundamentals. I don't care what the sport is. If it's football, baseball, soccer, tennis, baseball, you name it. Every team has fundamentals for that sport they have to do correctly. We have fundamentals in the church as well. Some folks call them holy habits. Because when you practice the habit and develop, then you have what we call muscle memory. You can do it automatically without thinking. What do you suppose is one of the greatest holy habits that we have as Christians? What? Prayer, Prayer absolutely. Prayer is one of the first and foremost holy habits that we have as a church. You pray before you go to bed at night. You pray when you get up in the morning throughout the day. If there's something that's, that's bothering you, you stop and pray about it. So prayer is certainly one of our best holy habits. What else is another holy habit? All of y'all are old enough to read, right? So if you're old enough to read, what is something you should be reading? The Bible. And as y'all heard me say many times, it's not enough to read the Bible. You have to do what? Study it. So Bible study is a holy habit that helps us to become like Christ. And here's the thing. When we read the Bible and study it, we don't do it on our own, whether you're in a group study like we have or you're at home. You pray as you read so that the Holy Spirit will help you to understand what is written in the Bible. Because keep in mind, it was the Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible to be written the first time. So the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the Bible and the Holy Spirit inspires the readers of the Bible. Now, the Bible tells us not to be hearers of the word only, but to be what? Doers of the word. So what's another holy habit for us? Shattering the, the gospel. Doing what God is calling you to do. And each and every one of us has a calling to share Christ's love with the world. So you pray about it. You read and study about it, then you get out and do it. And guess what? You don't do it alone. Jesus promised that he'd be with us every day, every step of the way, even to the end of the age. So when he comes again, then we're going to have a bigger celebration than we're having today. It's going to be glorious. But together, using the talents that God has given us, practicing the holy habits, we can be the church of Jesus Christ. We can be God's children here and now today. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for giving us your son who died for our sins and gives us the promise of the resurrection. And thank you for your Holy Spirit that fills us with your power 
and guides us and directs us. And being the children you created us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now I get hugs from all y'all. I like that shirt. They didn't do too well yesterday against Notre Dame. That's all right. Doing good.
Our Old Testament lesson today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 4. Hear are the words of the prophet. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Yes. Good morning. morning. The epistle text this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and then verses 11 through 16. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. He himself granted that some are apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, with each part is working as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Thank you, Liz. Excuse me. And our gospel text comes from the gospel of Matthew, and I'm not going to ask you to stand as I normally do because I'm going to do a little bit of expository reading and preaching as I Read this, and then I'll get into the sermon in full measure. Yes, up. So here now, the parable of the talents that Jesus gives us from Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. You notice he didn't call someone else's servants. He called his own And he delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. Did you take note of that? He gave to each of his servants according to their own ability, which means he knows his servants very well. And he knows what they are able to do and what they aren't able to do. So he's given the talents according to what their abilities are. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them 
and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two talents gained two more also. But he who had received the one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, You delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there is what you have is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, the third servant really didn't know his master. His master knew him, which is why he only entrusted him with the one talent. But folks, do you all realize how much one talent was at that day? It was a sum of money greater than what a person would earn in a lifetime. That's how much he entrusted to him. And it's obvious the servant didn't know the master because he describes him far differently than the other two. The other two were delighted to be able to share the good news with their master of how they had doubled What he had given them. While the third servant. Who was undisciplined. Says I'm giving you back what you gave to me. Because I know you to be a hard master. And his Lord says oh is that the case. Well then you should at least invest it in the bank. And I'd have back my own with interest. Had the master wanted the money Buried in the ground, don't you think? He could have done it himself or had another servant taken buried in the ground? Or could not he have invested himself with the bankers? But no. The master was giving this servant the opportunity to share in the master's work. Giving him an opportunity to take the talent that he had received from his master and put it to good work. Not to bury it in the ground. And each and every one of us has received a talent as well. Do you know that our English word tavern, talent, comes from this passage of scripture? In fact, as we know from the scripture, talent doesn't mean ability to play music or, you know, gifted in sports, what we would consider a talent. It was a large sum of money. But the word that we have today for talent is from that parable because a talent is a great treasure. Not because of who we are, but because of who gave us 
that talent. Go ahead and advance the slide. You see, the Holy Spirit helps us to be the church. The gift of the talent is not our blessing alone. God blesses us so that together we have all that we need to be the church of Jesus Christ today. To accomplish our mission, not just of making disciples, but of also sending the disciples out into the world. To make the world a better place today, but to also make God's kingdom come on earth. That his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Folks, that is not a goal for when Christ comes again. That is the goal for when Christ returns. He will see that we have taken the talents that he has entrusted to us to make his kingdom come on earth today. That is an awesome responsibility. Now, the Bible tells us in a number of places, in addition to Ephesians, in Romans and in Corinthians, that the Holy Spirit gives lots of different gifts to folks, but it's always the same Spirit who is giving the gift in accordance with what the Spirit knows each of us to be. See, the Holy Spirit knew that I didn't have the gift to sing to be in the choir. Got the gift to love music, but just not the ability to, to sing it. I can play the radio pretty well, however. If we all had the same gift, we could not succeed in our mission. If the whole football team were quarterbacks, because the quarterback seems to be the star, could they win a ball game? Who's going to catch the ball if you throw it, if we're all quarterbacks? Who is going to block to keep the other team from coming in and sacking the quarterback if we're all quarterbacks? If we were all receivers, who's going to throw us the ball? If we were all linemen, who's going to run the plays? You see, the same thing is true with the church. We have all been given different gifts from the Holy Spirit so that together we can succeed in our mission, which is spreading Christ's love around the world, beginning with where we are. Now, the gifts that Paul mentions in his letter to the Ephesians that Liz read earlier, the fivefold gifts of the Spirit, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are not just gifts. They are functions as well. They're, they're offices. Think of them like our vital organs. You know, we have vital organ systems within our body that keep us alive. We've got, you know, the heart. So there's a circulatory system that keeps blood flowing where we need it. We, we've got our, our lungs, our pulmonary system, so that it's keeping oxygen going to all the different parts of the body and also carrying the carbon dioxide away. Okay. We have our nervous system with the brain in the center of that so everything can operate you know, as it's supposed to. We've got a skeletal system that enables us to walk upright and, and do these things. You know, if one of our vital organs were to fail, what would happen to our body? We'd die of organ failure, would we not? If just one of them. All right, the Bible talks about five vital systems. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Think about the church today. And of those vital systems, how many do you think are really firing on all cylinders within the church? We don't see too many apostles, do we? Very few evangelists. And when was the last time you heard a prophet speak? No. Pastors and teachers are about the only vital functions that we have operating in the church today. So it isn't any wonder then that the church of Jesus Christ 
is in the shape it's in. For indeed, if the body of Christ was like our human body, it'd be dead. Praise be to God that our God is the God of the resurrection. You know, there's a reason there are more church planters than there are those called to revive churches. I know in seminary, a lot of my classmates, yeah, they were wanting to be church planters. Very few were wanting to go and revitalize existing old churches. Do you all know why that is? Quite simply, it's easier to give birth than it is to bring the dead back to life. (laughs) Am I right or wrong? (laughs) But as I said, our God is the God of the resurrection. The Holy Spirit is what gives us new life and empowers us to be the church today, a church that can succeed in its mission. The reason we don't have apostles and prophets and evangelists today is we don't know we have the gift. The Holy Spirit is still gifting people, but we're unaware of the gift. Or we may be aware that we have the gift, but we're undisciplined in our use of it. And as Nick Saban says, talent without discipline is nothing. Now, the good news is, if you're unaware of your spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit will make you aware of it. And if you're undisciplined, the Holy Spirit can help you with that as well. Because the holy habits that we have are not hard. They really aren't. Even someone who is illiterate can pray. And indeed, the Bible says, when you can't come up with the word to pray, the Holy Spirit will pray on your behalf. That it will intercede with God with groans and moans that human language cannot communicate. So the Holy Spirit will help you pray. And if you can read, and look at the ground here, I think all of us can read. The Holy Spirit will help you to understand the scriptures. Just as the Holy Spirit called Philip the evangelist from a thriving ministry up in Samaria, all the way to this wilderness road where a single Ethiopian eunuch was traveling back home after having been rejected in the temple. The Holy Spirit called Philip the evangelist to explain to that person what the scriptures had to say about him. The same Holy Spirit will help guide you in your reading and understanding of scriptures so that you can study and then do. The Holy Spirit will help you. Whatever gift you have, the Holy Spirit will help you to become disciplined enough to use that gift so that together... This charge will be able to complete our mission here in our community. And it truly does take all of us. Truth be told, it takes more than us. Which is why Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but what? The labors are few. He didn't say then throw in the towel and give up because we're not enough. What did he say do? Pray, therefore, to the Lord of the harvest to bring more laborers. One of the holy habits is to pray. Part of our regular prayer life ought to be to pray for more laborers so that we have more gifts to work together for God's good purpose. This is what being the church is about today. It's not just a social club for saints, as some says, but it really is triage for a hurting world. And folks, God knows what shape this world is in. He's the one who made it. He's the one who is still looking relentlessly 
at this world being what he created to be. The study that we've been doing on the Holy Spirit reminds us from Scripture that each and every one of us is a temple of God. You might not think of yourself as a temple, but that's exactly what you are. Because you were created in whose image? God's. So when God first formed the first human, in the middle of the garden that he made, formed him in his image and breathed his holy breath into him and he became a living soul. Each of us today have been made in that same holy image. Sin is what tarnished that image and distorted it so God would not see himself when he looked at us. Neither would the rest of creation recognize the creator in us. But God sent his son to fix that problem. And by Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, we have been set free from slavery to sin and death. We no longer bear the ugly stain of sin. But when the Creator looks at us, he can see himself. And when creation looks at us, they can see the Creator. This is what the Holy Spirit is helping us to do today. The question is, are we cooperating with the Spirit or are we stifling the Spirit? Paul says later in his letter to the Ephesians, do not stifle the Spirit that God has given you. If we are undisciplined and do not use the talent that God has given us, then we will stifle the Spirit and we will not succeed. But, if we will surrender our will to God and let him guide and direct us and discipline us through the Holy Spirit, we will not only survive, we will thrive. We will be the church that God created us to be here and now and for hereafter. To the glory of God and our neighbor's good. Will you please stand with me? And affirm our faith with this article from our Articles of Religion and Confession of Faith. Let us profess this together. We believe the Christian church is a community of all true believers under the Lordship of Christ. We believe it is one, holy, apostolic, and Catholic. It is the redemptive fellowship in which the word of God is preached by men and women divinely called, and the sacraments are duly administered according to Christ's own appointment. Under the discipline of the Holy Spirit, the church exists for the maintenance of worship, the edification of believers, and the redemption of the world. Let us sing the glory of poetry as our tithes and offerings run. prayer prayer of thanksgiving together merciful God whose wisdom surpasses all understanding we offer these gifts as a token of our faith and devotion in a world full of uncertainties may these offerings be used to spread your hope and love teach us to listen to your voice amid the noise and to trust in your steadfast presence bless our giving that it may build your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our closing hymn this morning is number 714. And I want you all to pay attention to the words that you're singing. Because this is a summation of our faith. We, we may not know how God gives us the gifts he does. But we do know that it is he who gives them. Because the Bible says all good gifts come from God. And so we know that the one in whom we put our trust is trustworthy. So let us sing joyfully, I know whom I have believed. like the wicked lazy servant who doesn't know their master we are the profitable servants we know our Lord we know whom we have believed in and we know that he is able to keep that which we've committed until that day and so until that day we go and do the Lord's work every day here where we are or wherever we may be sent knowing that we don't go out alone, but Christ has promised to go with us. His Holy Spirit will sustain us in our effort and give us the victory. So go with God's love, his peace, his joy, and his blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Uh,